やっほー、聞こえませんかはい、there is like a stream delay, but it's okay. Today, I will be doing something a little bit different from what I usually do. It's not a quiet writing stream. Yes, you get to hear my voice again. How nice. Right, it's、um, a reaction video to someone I found on a Minecraft server who is also a writer. Guzen <laughs> kana? Right, it's not so much of like a coincidence. I guess there are more writers than I thought there would be playing Minecraft. Who knew, right? So, anyways, I, I will stream the Minecraft play kind of with them on like、um, the second channel if you are interested in that. But today, I will be reacting to Keelan Powell's. Video. It's 40 minutes long, guys, so it's gonna be quite a long stream. The guy in question who made this video will be with us as well. This is a very good,、um, how do I say, contribution to world building. If you are like a writer who doesn't know what the fuck world building is because you don't play DD and you've not like read a lot of fantasy books, or if you're a romance writer who wanna switch over, like if you're writing FL and you wanna go into ML, this is probably it for you. It can be a little bit techy, it can be a little bit geeky, it can be a little bit overwhelming information, which is why. I have the man in question over here to kind of clarify things for us, especially like my brain is not so good. <laughs> my brain and my voice is not so good today, so I, I will be needing a lot of call help. We have them on call as well, so if you are interested, please also subscribe to them. Check out their entire video itself if you need like any timestamps and points like that. So please help them out. This is pretty good. I think it's pretty good. I've not seen it, but I think it's pretty good because there's a lot of effort going in, and I kind of know them. So I know that they are not bullshitting with their stuff. They actually did proper stuff. So without further ado, I will introduce you to a good pal who plays Minecraft with me as well. Let's meet Keelan Powell. Yahoo! You there? Hello. Okay. I am there. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start like the video now. You wanna introduce yourself first before I start though, to like the people who watch playback. I, I guess it would make more sense for you to introduce me and then for me to just be like, hello. Yeah, I already said I, I introduced you as the person I found on the Minecraft server. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. What do you do when you don't play Minecraft though? <laughs> What do I do when I don't play Minecraft? Um, I do science communications. That is what I do. A little elaboration for the people with small brains like me. Ah, okay, okay.、Um, so, what I do is I get employed by organizations and by government departments to,、um, to basically just explain the science that's in their policies and in their.、Um, In their just business ventures and stuff like that, just to explain the science to the public. So it's like a dumbing down of difficult things for small brains. Well, no, more like,、um, more like the companies and governments usually don't actually understand the science that they're actually doing. Like they don't understand it. Okay, okay. okay.、Um, And so they get someone else and they say, Hey, can you explain this thing we don't understand to the public and try to make us look better? And sometimes I do just say no because I'm just like, You are destroying the environment with this, and I have ethics and morals and stuff.、Um, and so I will just refuse a contract sometimes on those grounds. But most of the time I don't because most of the time when they want science communications, It's because they're not doing something bad. Because if they are doing something bad, usually they'll try to hide it and not get that communicated in simple terms to the public. Hmm. Nanka, m u s k a s h i k e d o Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. Chat, if you have any questions, please just leave it there. I will get to it. Somehow, eventually, like in the middle of the stream. So, we'll have like breaks while we watch through this. <laughs> If I don't understand, this is why we have Walking Dictionary as the creator of this <laughs> to explain to us what it means. <laughs> okay, let's, let's begin now. Okay, without further ado.
Let's imagine for a moment that we're astrophysicists. For us, order of magnitude estimates are as good as precise answers. We work in natural units, so pi equals 1, and our periodic table looks like this. Hydrogen, helium, and metals. But why? Let's go back to just after the Big Bang, when everything had cooled off enough for all the protons, neutrons, and electrons to form groups. Groups we call atoms. However, at this time, the atoms didn't come in as wide a variety as they do today. No, instead there were only two elements, hydrogen and helium. As time passed, gravity pulled the hydrogen and helium atoms together, closer and closer and closer until they couldn't possibly take up any less space. And then they fused. Two atoms became one, two hydrogen atoms became one helium atom. Three atoms became one. Three helium atoms became one carbon, or one metal, as an astrophysicist might say. It didn't end there. It takes a lot less energy to keep a helium atom intact than a hydrogen atom, and a lot less energy to keep a carbon atom intact than a helium atom. That excess energy had to go somewhere. The energy became heat. The heat made the atoms restless, jostling each other aside for more space. The heat fought back against gravity, and gravity pulled back against the heat until they reached a stalemate. A stalemate we call hydrostatic equilibrium, in which gravity and thermal pressure match each other perfectly to create what we call a star. A star that constantly creates more heat and more light only to yield it to the wide, empty universe in every direction. Many billions of years ago, the first of these stars ran out of hydrogen and helium to fuse together. Gravity finally won its war with heat, and the first stars started to collapse. But heat had one last trick up its sleeve. In the smaller stars, as gravity pulled the outer layers in, hydrogen and helium in those layers that had not yet fused did exactly that. Heat was born again, and pushed out harder than ever until those once small stars became red giants, slowly shedding their outer layers rich with metals into space, until only a white dwarf remained. In the larger stars, though, gravity's folly was spectacular. Much like the smaller stars, the outer layers collapsed, but there was so much more mass with so much more energy bottled up inside, those outer layers fell towards the core so, so fast. Bang! The outer layers collided with the core with such force that they bounced back. Those outer layers exploded into the universe, bringing with them so many metals and creating even more as atoms collided in the catastrophic supernova, leaving a tiny neutron star behind. Now the real story begins. Gravity didn't take its defeat lying down. It grabbed hold of those outer layers and formed them into new stars, and anything that didn't manage to collect into a star became something new. Planets, moons, asteroids, rich in metals, and much colder than a star. Old enough, the compounds could start to form. Compounds like dihydrogen monoxide, or as we prefer to call it, water. Okay, I'm going to pause right here. My brain is not coping. I did not expect to be launched into a science lecture about how the Big Bang Theory is. <laughs> oh my! I God. mean, this is this is just the the introduction, just to give context to where we're coming from, where these planets come from, and just. Uh, technically, yes, but I was not expecting this because, you know, most, <laughs> most writers are a lot dumber than they actually think they are. <laughs> not gonna lie, okay? Most writers, we are dumber than we think we are. So it's like, uh, I think I'm smart, but actually I, I don't, I'm not that smart. This is more like, a, how, how do I say? Is it physics class or is it astrology? I don't know. Well, I mean, it's definitely not astrology. Astrology is like zodiacs and star signs and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's astronomy at the moment. But it's going to get into um, at the end of each section. There's a there's a part where I explain how it's can be applied to writing and how it's applied to making a fantasy map. I mean, it's very realistic, but you realize that a lot of 
writers in a sense they just wing it they they create laws from no nowhere like unlike you who studies science the majority <laughs> of us just make up signs from things that we see heck did, did you know that um i'm not good at biology i used to think that um men had one more bone than women like skeletal system mm -hmm. yeah because they had this thing called a boner so I was like, a bono is a bono. Ah, yes. <laughs> my level of logic is elementary. So when I saw this, I was like, oh, my teacher will kill me in my sleep tonight because I don't know what it's talking about, like hydrogen. Okay, I get the hydrogen part. The helium, I was like, helium does not naturally exist. Like what? And then the helium combines into carbon and I'm like, what am I looking at at this point of time? And then when metals and planets and things and explosions came out, okay, the only thing that I took away from all this is that uh, science is very complicated. That's all. That's that all. is true. Science is complicated. But the, the important takeaway will be the thing about seasons that is going to come up quite soon. Okay, let me resume then. Seasons. I will keep an eye out. Do I have seasons? No, I don't even have seasons in my country. What the fuck? Okay, let's see <laughs> how it's created. I have no idea. Too close to a star and water turns to gas. Too far and it freezes solid. Just the right distance and you get liquid water. This distance is known as the Goldilocks zone and it's where planet water. This distance is known as the Goldilocks zone. This distance is known as the what? Goldilocks zone. The like, you know, Goldilocks and the three bears of, um, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that one I relate to. It's it's really called the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. I mean, there's also another thing in physics called the potato radius, which is the um, radius at which a um, an object is large enough that it will become spherical under its own mass. And so if that's called the potato radius, because anything smaller than that kind of just looks like a mutated potato. Oh my god, is that how couch potato comes about? I certainly hope so. <laughs> okay, we're all potatoes. That's good, that's good. We don't... We exist to something. Okay, oh, wow. Goldilocks zone, who named that? It... I have no idea who named it, but someone who was having fun. So Goldilocks first in the Goldilocks zone, or Goldilocks first in the Three Bears story? Our Three Bears story predates it by hundreds of years. Ooh, okay. Well then, writers over science, let's go. Indeed. And it's where planets lie that might support life. Gas giants are also able to provide their moons with enough heat for liquid water by flexing them with their strong gravitational pull, which causes friction and subsequently heat. For now though, let's focus on the planets. Planets around second or third generation stars, like our sun, are rich in the metals shed into space when the first generation stars died. Holy fuck, what is this? This is a periodic table that each of the elements that you've got on there, it tells you where they came from, as in the elements on Earth. Where did they come from? Are you sure this is like so an like, official one? Yeah. My god. Okay. So like you can see carbon there, about 15% of it comes from um, exploding massive stars, and then the rest mostly comes from dying low mass stars. Okay. Mm. Okay. Because it's And then after and then after plutonium, absolutely everything is just man-made. Where is plutonium? Uh P U down the bottom, bottom line. P U P P U P P U. Yeah, right down the bottom. Ah ah ah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, I have no idea about this because um, the periodic table that I know kind of looks a little bit different from this for some reason. Yeah, they, they had like numbers at the top, like 1 to 7 or 8 or something like that. Yeah, that's what it typically would look like, yeah. But this one, they don't include that because the important part of this periodic table is where the elements actually originated rather than the information about the element itself about like mass number and proton number and things like that 
What does merging neutron stars mean? So there's an event, there's a cataclysmic event that can happen in space that was only discovered in the past few decades, that you can have two neutron stars, which are really, really dense stars. They get close, really, really, really close together, and then they start spinning around each other super, super fast. And when they collide, they just emit a whole lot of energy and have a whole lot of just particles just shooting out away from them. And because it's so incredibly hot and so incredibly dense in that environment, it forces elements together and it forces them to fuse into elements that are larger than iron. Because usually, just inside a star, you can't get anything heavier than iron because it consumes energy. Mm -hmm. And stars obviously need to emit energy to survive. But um, merging neutron, a, mer a neutron star merger event is so incredibly energetic, just has so much output energy that it can fuse things heavier than iron. Mm, so they are not found on Earth normally? Is that what it they is? They are found on Earth. They are found on Earth, but they only got here because neutron stars that merged kind of sprayed those atoms into space and they landed on Earth. So they are like alien elements, in a sense. They are absolutely alien elements, yes. They do not come from our solar system. They come from elsewhere in the galaxy. Oh, wow. Okay. And you can see gold, for example, AU number 79. Mm -hmm. That's most, that mostly comes from merging neutron stars. Gold is not an Earth object. It did not originate on Earth, no. What? Holy shit. Well, I mean, that's why, just think about that um, all of the gold that humans have ever dug up, mm -hmm. you could put that into a 25 meter by 25 meter by 25 meter cube. All of the gold that we've ever dug out of the ground as a species could fit into a cube with sides of 25 meters. That's how small it would be. Wait, then what about all those gold mines and, like, gold penning and stuff like that? So, it didn't come from Earth, then it fell into Earth. It did, it fell onto Earth. Through what, an asteroid? Uh, probably not an asteroid, mostly just, um, little particles that just fell down through the atmosphere, like single atoms. So we can't even see it? No, not as it's coming down onto Earth. Oh no. Oh no. So would there be like undiscovered particles that land here that we haven't discovered? Oh yeah, absolutely. So many. <laughs> okay. This makes makes things very complicated, but sure. All right. <laughs> oh, the periodic table. It's been what, ten years since I last saw this shit. <laughs> okay, let let me continue. Fuck. As well as a few other cataclysmic cosmic events. Astrophysicists call everything other than a hydrogen and helium metals because they make up only 1% of the conventional matter in the universe. That is only 1% of everything that's not dark matter. This 1% is vitally important though because it enables the complex chemistry required for life. Carbon especially, which is more chemically versatile than the rest of the periodic table combined. Without carbon, we don't have life. The way a planet orbits its star is also important for life on its surface. The planet will have to spin relative to the star in order to have a day-night cycle, and to have a seasonal cycle, that spin should be at an angle. Note the should, not must. We'll get back to that in a second. A tilt causes light to hit different parts of the planet at different angles at different times of year. Light imparts the most energy if it hits a surface at a perfect 90 degree angle and imparts less as that angle decreases. That's how Earth's seasons work. During summer, in whichever hemisphere you live in, sunlight is hitting the surface at an angle closer to 90 degrees and further from 90 degrees during winter. Now let's get back to that should. Eccentricity can also cause seasons. That is, the planet orbiting in an oval rather than a circle, meaning it's closer to the star at some times of the year and further in others. Okay, pause. I have two questions. Why do you say that yes. without carbon, life cannot exist? So, carbon... 
carbon is a kind of a very special element that can do lots and lots of things. There are no elements that can do as many. In fact, carbon can do more things than every other element on the periodic table combined. Mm -hmm. That is how incredibly versatile carbon is. And you need that versatility of carbon to make things complicated enough to be alive. Okay, okay. I still don't get how life is formed by atoms, but sure. The other one is like a mystery. Okay, the second question. Is this the diagram of the potato thing that you were saying? No. No. <laughs> These are diagrams of the circle in the middle is meant to be just a star, and then around the outside is um the orbit of a planet. Star. Orbit. Ah, okay, okay. So it's not always in like a full circle around it. It's not always a perfect circle, no. It can be skewed a little bit. But why though? It's like a hula hoop went wrong. Uh, it's just however the planet happened to form. Um, because generally you have stars are spinning and all of the matter around stars are spinning as well, but it could just be that that spinning disk, when it collected into a planet, it wasn't a circle, it was just an oval. Where'd the disk come from, though? Who made the disk? Uh, that would be, in the case of our star, that disk was made by a previous star exploding and dying, and then all of that matter that the star exploded into collected up into another star, but then there was some stuff left behind that was orbiting around that star, and then that stuff collected into planets. Mm. Except the asteroid belt. Oh. And the Kuiper belt. I cannot remember, but it sounds like something like you have a boss, an old boss, and then your old boss left, and then your new, your new boss came, and your new boss wanted to implement some change, but they couldn't because the old system works? I guess so. Okay, makes sense. The orbit can't be too eccentric, or else it might leave the Lagoliloc zone, which would boil or freeze all of the planet's water. However, the eccentricity that a habitable planet can have can lead to interesting seasonal dynamics. For a planet with no tilt, higher eccentricity would lead to especially hot but short summers and long, freezing winters. No eccentricity and no tilt would lead to a planet with no seasons. No or low eccentricity, and a tilt, gives relatively equal length seasons like Earth's. Finally, high eccentricity and a tilt would lead to very interesting seasons indeed. <laughs> One hemisphere would have brief scorching summers and extended icy winters, while the other would have much milder seasons, with the tilt and eccentricity cancelling each other out to some extent. The first thing to decide when making a map is which seasonal regime we're choosing. Do we want Earth-like seasons with summers and winters of equal length? Do we want very short, scorching summers and long, frozen winters? Do we want no seasons at all? Or do we want short summers and long winters in one hemisphere and very mild seasons in the other? For the sake of fun, I'm going with that last one, with our northern hemisphere getting the mild seasons and our southern hemisphere getting the extreme seasons. It won't be important until we start making biomes, but it's worth setting up that part early. I'm also going to say that the planet spins the opposite direction to Earth because chaos and violence, etc, etc. Next, we're going to draw one continent. It'll be pretty random, it doesn't really matter how it looks, though I'm not sure how the other continents should look. I mean, Africa used to be attached to South America, right? And Australia to Antarctica. So, I guess we should learn about that. Okay, pause. Be before you go to the, the planet thingy, like, um, what program were you using previously? Uh, you mean the, the map drawing software? Yeah. Uh, that is Wonderdraft. Hmm? Yeah, send, 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 send me on Discord. Okay. Yeah. Right, so that I can yeah. actually link it to my viewers who want to use it. Wonder Draft. Typing ASMR. I will go. I will go and find the website for it. It's free? Free to use? Or? 
Uh, no. It is a single one-time purchase. Ah, uh, okay. It's not subscription software. That's the important thing. True that. Is it? Is it useful? Is it good? It is quite good. Yeah. What is it used like mostly for? Is it a working profession software or? Uh, no, it's exclusively a map making software. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Right, I'll yeah, it costs thirty US dollars. <laughs> okay, so unless unless the people are really like into map making, I don't think it's Yeah, that's not something you should buy unless you're intending to make a whole bunch of fantasy maps. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Good to know. So I will write it down, like I will link the dis in the description this what oh what would they call it again? Wonder Draft. I will link Wonder Draft in description for those of you who want. Oh, we are finally at part two. Damn, I had a lot of questions, but sure. Right, so now it's like the plate trick. What was that? Plate tectonics. Plate tectonics. Now that we have a planet, we need a surface. If we're going for an Earth-like planet, then we have continents with tall mountain ranges and expansive oceans beneath a clear sky. What we're going to need for all of these features are plate tectonics. Tectonic plates are sections of Earth's crust floating on top of the much denser mantle. Convection currents in the mantle cause the plates to move around and often collide and diverge. When two tectonic plates collide or diverge, something has to give. In collisions, usually one plate is pushed under another in a process called subduction. If the collision is between a continental plate and an oceanic plate, the thinner and denser oceanic plate will be pushed under the thicker and less dense continental plate. The continental plate tends to buckle, which results in ranges of hills, plateaus, or mountains. In some cases, when continental plates collide, both plates will be pushed upwards, forming taller mountains faster than subduction, like the Himalayas, which are still growing as the Indian plate continues to collide with the Eurasian plate. When tectonic plates diverge, they can leave large rift valleys in their wake. Often the edges of plates on either side of these valleys will float higher on the mantle, forming highlands or even mountains. Due to the nature of mountain formation through plate tectonics, it's highly unlikely for mountain ranges to have significant angles in them. As you'd expect tectonic plates to buckle exclusively in the direction of a convergence or divergence. The only exception I can find are the extremely messy mountains of southern Europe, created by the convergence of the African and Eurasian I'd like to place. point out, I looked at every mountain range on Earth just to check to see if there were right angles or sharp angles anywhere. What? That took a long time, but I looked at all of them. <laughs> okay. Just it's... to make sure what I was saying was correct. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I think you would fare better making this into like a science documentary more than a writing documentary mm, potentially yeah so like you can make it into like a documentary for like a science portion and then use that as a support for your writing portion if that makes any sense mm. yeah perhaps yeah but though, just like have two separate videos yeah it's like why 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 is the right angle so important though i mean it's because it's just very strange to have a mountain range that's just like, ah, yes, I go straight up and then I go straight to the side. Like, how? How can that happen? With Because mountains have to be pushed up by something. Mm -hmm. And like, how are you going to have things pushing like at two right angles on the same plate? It's just, it doesn't make sense. I mean, something could have jumped and then there was a leak and then it got like squashed. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, you know, when you cook, it happens. Have you, have you cooked? I'm... I mean, it depends on what you're cooking, I guess. Yeah, it's always possible. Like, okay, I don't know about regular people, but I am a disaster myself. Culinary disaster. So I know how this works. And if we're talking about the earth in itself, like if it's a very... Mm, how do I say, like, unbaked cookie, and then on the top it's like, you know, you, you're trying to microwave it, so it's like gooey on the insides, but it's hard on the outside. Yeah, it can kind of happen that way. It cracks. Yeah, but those are, those are cracks, those aren't mountains. Yeah, but if it cracks and then the hot fudge seeps out, that kind of feels like that, no? 
but but you see the big difference here is that um the way you're to you what you're talking about would be as if there were a crack in the earth and then a huge amount of magma just came out of the mantle and just formed gigantic rocks yep. just by spurting upwards which is not what happens to create mountains what yeah. happens to create mountains is that two bits of um, Earth's crust smash together and they push each other upwards. Huh? Okay, so it's like the cookie crust coming together, colliding, and then becoming a mountain. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of weird, but sure. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it happens on Earth, then logic doesn't really matter anymore, does it? This is a proof that logic doesn't always work so well. What happens once on Earth, mm -hmm. once on an entire planet, does this right angle thing happen? So you looked all over. I did. I looked at every single mountain range. It took <laughs> so long. Dedication. How long? 20 hours. Uh, I think it took like four or five hours overall. I'm assuming you're like very pro with all the areas of Earth by now then. If you went through Google Earth, I mean. I went to Google Earth, yeah. Mm, yeah, that, that is Could probably uh, okay. look at a mountain range and be like, I oh, guess I remember that mountain range. <laughs> that was during the uh, third hour that I was staring at mountain ranges. PTSD. Video making PTSD. Not <laughs> 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 All right, so like the takeaway points for anyone who is using this guide to build your planet or world, it doesn't fucking matter, okay? You can make it any way you want. If this kind of fucked up formation can exist naturally with no sense of explanation of how the fuck it got there, well, you can always assume that you can make your world high on crack and anything is possible. You you can make like a mountain range surrounding like a middle of a planet or something. I don't, I don't know, but it is possible you can do it. You don't have to, you know, follow the logic of how this creates itself, I guess, because it's fantasy map making. But these are the general guidelines if you want to make it more logically accepted. if you want to make it realistic yeah mm. like i i don't have anything against unrealistic maps um i just think that sometimes people want to make something more realistic to be honest if they want to make something more realistic the easiest way is to reference to the current society or planet or place or environment that you live in that is the most realistic anyone can get mm. Rule of thumb, rule of thumb, I mean. So you can mm. reference to, like, for example, how many planets do we have? Ten? Ten planets? Eight eight planets? I forgot. How many planets do we have in our solar system? Yeah, you, you can just, like, modify the numbers mm. a little bit, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the only planet that's habitable that we have is Earth. We have one of those. <laughs> mm-hmm. Makes sense. All right. And then if your story, it depends on your story, what kind of story you want to write to create the map. So for example, if you're having intergalactical war, obviously having only one Earth-like planet is not going to work in your solar system. It is system. not. Yeah, you, you gotta make like another one, like Earth's dark twin or maybe a parallel world for like intergalactic wormhole where they come in and out. Something like that. It doesn't have to make logical sense because it's fantasy, but you want to stick to the guideline of Earth having people and Earth having intelligent beings and Earth having evolutions and whatnot in the environment that was like talked earlier before in this first part where I had questions about it. Yeah, those could be a little bit more important, but not superly into details of how carbon is formed. It doesn't have to be carbon. Give it a new name, surely, maybe, okay? All right, I'm going to continue this because it's a long video. With the African plate being subducted under the Eurasian plate, which also shrunk an ocean until all that was left was what we called the Mediterranean Sea. Even then, it's hard to claim the mountain ranges actually form sharp angles when the whole of southern Europe is an absolute mess of mountains and valleys. Mountains can also be formed by volcanoes, which form most often in subduction zones, where the crust is weakened and magma from the mantle can break through. The Pacific Ring of Fire is the best example of such volcanoes. Notably, volcanoes can also exist independently of plate tectonics. When a mantle plume, which is an area of the mantle much hotter than its surroundings, breaks through the crust, these are most common in oceans where the crust is thinner. 
A good example is Hawaii, where the island chain itself is a record of the movement of the Pacific plate over the underlying mantle plume. Now, what if a planet doesn't have plate tectonics? Well, I'm here to tell you that if your planet doesn't have plate tectonics, then your planet doesn't have life. Let me explain. Volcanoes release water vapor, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere when they erupt, in a process called outgassing. Then, during subduction, carbon is pulled back down into the Earth. This is known as the deep carbon cycle, and maintains the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Mars and Venus are two examples of planets without plate tectonics, and in both cases, their atmospheres are primarily carbon dioxide. The outgassing of volcanoes, and yes, you can have volcanoes without plate tectonics, has pumped huge quantities of carbon dioxide into their atmospheres. Even if Venus wasn't too close to the sun to have liquid water, it would still have a primarily carbon dioxide atmosphere due to its lack of plate tectonics. However, the lack of plate tectonics does allow for one quite cool effect for the science fiction writers out there. The mostly CO2 atmosphere of Venus is 90 times denser than Earth's atmosphere, meaning that nitrogen and oxygen are lifting gases like helium is on Earth. Further, the region between 50 kilometers and 65 kilometers above the surface has almost the same temperature and pressure as the surface of the Earth. An interesting science fiction concept might be to float a city in that region of Venus's atmosphere. Trade between floating cities would be conducted by ships that also float in that region of the atmosphere, and you can't be certain that everyone with such a ship has good intentions. Some might even turn to piracy and become cloud pirates. It's just an idea. Cloud pirates. Well then, ignoring the cloud pirate idea for now, we know we want our continents to vaguely look like they could be pieced together, so I'll make some of the edges of the other landmasses look similar to my first one. I won't make any polar landmasses, since the grid I added at the start only goes up to 80 degrees north and south, meaning we have 10 degrees of latitude we can't see. Now the landmasses are done, I'm going to start drawing tectonic boundaries. I'm using trees to do this because I can easily erase them later, and because the way this program places them is quite jagged, which I like. First I'll draw the edges of our continental plates. They don't necessarily have to be on the edge of the continent, they can be a little way out to sea. I think I'll make some of the edges volcanic though, like the uh, pointy bit at the bottom of this central continent. I'm also going to model this area in the east after the Mediterranean, with one plate subducting under the other to make a smaller sea between. Now comes the boring part of just filling in the oceanic plate boundaries that aren't right next to continents. There's a good amount of freedom here, so I'm going to do it fairly randomly. Next I'll add in some continental fragments. These two pieces of land would have been between the central and southern continents. before they diverged. It would have been stretched out and flattened as they went, leaving only a small area above the ocean. Then I'm adding in an island chain made by a volcanic hotspot. The islands become smaller in the direction of motion of the plate, as those of the older islands, which have been eroded over time. I'm also adding an extra tectonic boundary through the southern continent, because I think some rifting would be cool. Next, we've got a volcanic landmass on a plate boundary. Some subduction going on there, telling us the northern half of the southern continent is moving further north. I'll give the eastern continent a big island nearby too. Don't want it feeling left out. This one's not volcanic, just a part of the same continental plate, like the British Isles are to Europe. Let's roughen up the continental edges a bit. They feel too smooth to me. And then add some islands to the ocean in the southeast, probably formed by volcanic hotspots that are long since inactive. And since these two oceanic plates are converging, I'll throw in some volcanoes in the subduction zone. There's likely a deep ocean trench there too, which would be pretty cool for underwater creatures if I uh, ever world build the societies of this planet. Mountain time, finally. Okay, mountains where one continental plate subducts the other. Let's go. Mountain We've got a time. nice balkanized region here. Some rift mountains where continental plates are diverging, of course. And a volcanic mountain range on the plate boundary here. 
like Japan, but connected to the continent. Then in the other subduction zones between continental and oceanic plates, we'll have some nice normal mountain ranges. These are good. We like these. Mountains are fun. We'll also add some mountain ranges where there aren't plate boundaries, but there were in the past. We call these areas passive continental margins, where the ocean ends but there's no plate boundary. You can have mountains in these regions, formed when much, much older tectonic plates converged or diverged, but have since fused or diverged so completely that the plate boundary no longer exists. The Scandinavian mountains in, well, Scandinavia, and the Great Dividing Range in Australia are both on passive continental margins. Now the mountain ranges and volcanic regions are all dealt with, we can delete all the trees marking the tectonic boundaries. No need to be concerned with them anymore. We do have to consider something else, though. That tree. And this is the shortest section. Hills aren't only formed by plate tectonics. They can also be formed by glaciers. As glaciers grow, they erode the rocks around them, scarring the land with valleys and lowlands. As they recede, they deposit all of their eroded materials into irregular hills and mounds. They can also leave water behind in depressions and lowlands as they melt, creating lakes. The largest of which on Earth are the North American Great Lakes. Melting glaciers in highlands or mountains can also create rivers, which will flow downhill until they reach the sea. Although rivers don't have to be formed by glaciers, they can be formed by any large elevated water source, like the accumulated snow caps on mountains, an underground pocket of water bursting through the ground, or even a lake overflowing due to rainfall. Over time, rivers can carve valleys and canyons into the ground, like the Grand Canyon in the US, carved out by the Colorado River over millions of years. An interesting mechanism for world building is the interaction between rivers and mountain formation. Because rivers erode land on a much shorter time scale than plate tectonics raise it into mountains, if a mountain range starts to form in the path of a river, the river can erode through it, creating what's known as a water gap, or if the river later dries up, a wind gap. This is particularly interesting for world building, because using rivers you can create one or two crossing points in an otherwise impenetrable mountain range, that factors significantly into trade, communications, and geopolitics. Okay, boss. I am a little bit lost. Right, so when you first create this, you need like a tectonic plate thing, and then you fill in the continent, the mountain thing, and then you fill in the rivers. But you said something like, uh, ma rivers create mountains? Is, is that what I understood? No, 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 no. <laughs> Uh, rivers can cut through mountains. So when mountains are being created, mountains rise up a lot slower than rivers erode land. So rivers can basically just erode a... Um, they can erode a gap through mountains. Where, where does the water from the river come from then? They came from mountains, right? It can come from mountains, but doesn't always have to. So it could come from mountains that were already there prior to the mountains that are now being created. Or it could come from um, come from just a lake that's in a higher up area that's flowing down from the lake. Um, it could come from an un it could, could come from an underground spring springing up from underground. Um, there are a lot of different sources. It doesn't necessarily have to come from mountains. It's just that often rivers do come from mountains. Okay, so they cut through mountains is what you are saying and lead to like the sea? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm assuming you're going to add that next into the map. Yeah. Okay, let me see. But more on that later in the video. Rain is significant for many rivers and lakes. Many of the salt lakes in Australia, for example, only contain water seasonally as they evaporate without rain to refill them. There are similarly intermittent rivers around the world, and even rivers that flow all year round often have a flooding season that shapes their banks. Alright, let's get us some glacial lakes on these continents. These will be in the north and south, where the polar glaciers extended during the last ice age, leaving behind a whole lot of large lakes.
you know what, I've decided this mountain range isn't tectonic anymore. It's actually a range of hills created by the glaciers as they receded. We'll still use the same mountain symbols, but we know now. We know the truth. Now for the rivers, going from highlands to the sea. Lots and lots of rivers all around the world. Okay, so I didn't add that many rivers, but this is an example map. It's not meant to be the greatest map ever created. Let's make sure to add some water gaps, though. Very important for world building. Water gaps? What is water, water gap? gaps? Water gaps, yeah. The thing I was talking about before where um, the river is going through the mountain range and it cuts through the mountain range as it rises up. The important thing about that is that historically um, a lot of cities have been built. Damascus, for example, is built on a water gap where the um, anti-Lebanon, they're built against, Damascus is built against the anti-Lebanon mountain range, um, which has a river going through it. And it's built on that river Damascus is built on that river so that they, thousands of years ago, could control the trade going through that river, and they could control the only pass through the mountains. So it's more like a political, societal setting more than a basic needs? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, if you want interesting politics in your world, water gaps are one way to achieve that. Mm, but like now, in a highly globalized sci-fi tech kind of situation you have airships right so they don't really oh yeah matter. absolutely but yeah if you're in a fantasy like medieval society then it matters but if you're in more of a sci-fi uh advanced technology society then not so much mm, okay Naruhodo. right let's continue one two three how many more parts <laughs> the next part is okay biomes okay let's go through biomes i only know minecraft biomes though Now we know how to shape a planet, let's consider its climate, more specifically biomes. Generally, biomes can be grouped into five types, forest, grassland, desert, tundra, and aquatic. The latter being over two-thirds of the Earth's Minecraft. surface, but getting the least attention, because humans mostly care about humans. And I'm no exception. Wait, what? Humans mostly care about humans? Did you just say that? Yes, I did just say that. What? That has to be the biggest <laughs> lie ever. <laughs> humans don't care about humans. Humans care about themselves. Themselves are humans. Technically... Mm. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, that's fair. Getting ...the least attention, because humans mostly care about humans. And I'm no exception, so for the remainder of this video, I'll be ignoring aquatic biomes. Okay. Of the remaining four, the main factor that determines which biome will prevail in any given location is water. So I should point out, I proceed to immediately not ignore aquatic biomes. <laughs> humans care about humans. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm actually happy that the aquatic environment is there because I like water a lot more. <laughs> if I could be reborn again, I want to be a fish. But yes, okay, let me just guess like all these other things because I'm familiar with Minecraft symbols. So I'm guessing the tree is the forest. The grass yep. is um plains? Is that plains? It it's it's the grasslands. There is a grassland? What is grassland? Savannah? The land of grass. There's... Savannah is a grassland, yeah. Okay. It's a type of grassland. Okay, okay. That one I know. Like the place of elephants and lions, okay. And then the one with the snow is um, Antarctica. Uh, no, no, Antarctica is a desert, actually. What? The one with the snow is a tundra. What country is a tundra? Canada? Uh, Siberia in Russia. Oh, okay, okay. The one with mm, the one with a lot of bears. Okay. Uh, the cactus one has to be like um Egypt desert, Middle East, right? Yeah, just deserts in general. Yeah. Okay, so where does the, like, Southeast Asia come in here, though? Uh, Southeast Asia is forest, m mostly, because it's a tropical region um, and gets a lot of rainfall. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Tropical region. Where is America, though? America has a lot of biomes. So America has deserts, it has forests, it has grasslands. It doesn't have any tundra. 
Mm. But that's the other three. Okay, makes sense. Right, we can continue. I, I can. I, I got this, I got this. Sunlight directly hits the equator Wait. of a planet all year round. This means that a lot of energy is transferred into the surface and enables significant water evaporation from the oceans, rivers, and seas along the equator. The hot air rises, carrying water vapor along with it, and the cooler air flows in from the north and south to take its place. No way, how do you know where the wind comes from? Or is it like always the same? So there are, there are prevailing winds around the world that, um, they're not always the same. Usually they go in one or two directions. They're, it's very, very complicated. And I don't fully understand it because I'm not a climatologist. Um, but generally speaking, on the equator, you will have winds um, heading towards the west. So they'll be coming from the east towards the west, so they're easterly winds. Um, and then just above the above and below the tropics, you'll have winds going to the east, so westerly winds, and then back at the equator, back at the poles, you will once again have easterlies coming from the east going to the west. And mm. that's pretty much just entirely because of the rotation of the earth. Oh, okay. I used to think that winds come from anywhere that has a sea. Also true. Okay. So there are smaller local winds, um that are created by the temperature difference between the land and the sea. Okay, so general rule of thumb for anybody who wants to like write this, two things to note. So one of it is the sea, the other one is the mountain, right? Because I'm pretty sure mountain blocks wind, if I'm not wrong. Yes, they do. That That is something I cover later on as well. Ooh, oh my god, I did not fail my geography even though I didn't study. That's great. Okay. Causing the air above to drop down to fill its place. Then finally, the hot air travels north and south to replace the sinking air, cooling down as it goes, causing the water vapor to precipitate and fall back down to the surface as rain. This is why so many forests are found in the tropics, because there's plenty of rain for large plants to grow. As the water starts to run out, forests transition into grasslands, which don't have enough water to support large trees, but plenty to support smaller bushes and grasses. Then finally, once the water carried from the equator runs out entirely, you get deserts, where barely any plants can survive. Africa is a great example of this pattern, with forests around the equator, grasslands up to the tropics, then deserts in the far north and south of the continent. Of course, it becomes a little more complicated when you factor in mountains, large rivers, and land masses that aren't conveniently centered on the equator. While in Africa, the forest fades into grassland and the grassland fades into desert as the air from the equator runs out of moisture, the biome divides elsewhere in the world aren't always so gradual. Most notably, mountain ranges can produce what's known as a rain shadow. Where a mountain range creates a rain shadow, clouds deposit rain on one side, but are unable to cross the mountains to provide water on the other side. The most distinct rain shadow on Earth is that of the Himalayas. South of the Himalayas, India, Nepal, and Bhutan all have dense forests, but Tibet to the north has no such greenery. Similar rain shadows also exist in Northern Africa, with the Atlas Mountains blocking rain from the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, in South America, where the Andes block rain from the Amazon Basin, and in Eastern Australia, where the Great Dividing Range blocks rain from the Pacific. You may have noticed I just mentioned rains from particular oceans, when previously I've only talked about rains from the oceans on the equator. This is because there are smaller local for convection currents between land and sea. During the day, the sun heats the land, so hot air above the land rises, allowing cold ocean air to flow in at lower altitudes, causing the nice sea breezes you experience in the afternoon. During the night, however, the land loses heat much faster than the ocean. So the warmer ocean air rises to higher altitudes and carries rain over the land. This is why we have forests far from the equator, like those in Europe, North America, and the southern and eastern edges of Australia. But then, if rain circulates between land and sea, why are there so many deserts on west coasts? 
two in Africa, one in South America, and one in Australia at the very least. This is where it gets a little more complicated. You know how I talked about the convection currents from the equator bringing rain straight north and south? That's not... Mm -hmm. What is hmm? Because, oh, I thought I heard something else. Like, what? Is it you? Is it the thing? Okay, I'll just continue. Continents. Warm air to the west, and therefore to the east coasts of continents. Then the cold, low altitude air heading back to the equator runs along the west coasts of continents. Because this air is too cold to hold moisture, the west coasts. Okay, I got a question, because there are like two different kinds, no, three different kinds of arrows, like the black one, the red one, and the blue one. How do you yes. come about with those? So, this isn't my diagram. This is a very fancy scientific diagram by very much someone else. Um, I think you can find this particular one on Wikipedia. Um, the... The red arrows are the hot air currents, the ones that carry rain. Um, the blue ones are the cold air currents, the ones that don't carry any rain at all. And then the black ones are the ones that, in some seasons, they carry rain, and in other seasons, they don't. They're just kind of the ones in between, the ones that are always hot or always cold. So the black ones are like the local ones that you're talking about? Is that it? Not really. The black ones are just the ones that connect the hot and the cold. Ah, uh, the transit. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. So do you think, like, I, I don't know, okay, from your point of view, if we cut off all the mountains, do you think the greenery will be better spread, in a sense, if we cut the mountains off, or would that be a terrible idea? So you get rid of mountains, you get rid of half the rivers in the world. <gasps> so a lot of a lot of, society, a lot of cities just wouldn't have water sources anymore, and that wouldn't be great. Uh, but yes, you would have more greenery in the world, probably. Um, because the mountains would pretty much just, and the mountains, the deserts would pretty much just be exclusively where um, either the rain is just, just can't get far enough inland, like the desert in Mongolia, mm -hmm. uh, the rain literally just can't get there because it's too far inland, or where it's just, where the rain from, rains from the equator have just run out, like the Sahara. Okay, so mountains are still necessary. It's terrible to get rid of them. Yes, absolutely awful. You delete the water sources for many cities if you do that. Okay, right. I was thinking it might be better to get the wind through if we cut the mountains, like make them a little shorter or something. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna continue. Continents. Because this air is too cold to hold moisture, the convection currents between land and sea in these regions don't carry rain with them, leading to deserts along many west coasts. If Earth spun the opposite direction, these coastal deserts would be in the east rather than the west. The circulating air currents combine to form circular air currents over each of the world's major oceans, except the Southern Ocean, which is why the British Isles are so warm despite being at a similar latitude to the cold parts of Canada. The circular current of the North Atlantic Ocean carries warm air from the Gulf of Mexico to the British Isles, and then on to the rest of Europe, significantly increasing the temperature of the western half of the continent and providing much needed rain to the forests of the region. We should probably briefly talk about tundras and cold deserts too. Tundras are areas characterized by a brief wet season in the hottest part of the year, which is still cold compared to most of the world. A layer of permafrost in the soil prevents plants from establishing deep root systems and what is permafrost? Uh, it is frost that is always there. Permanent frost. Why? Because it's cold. Tundras are cold? Wait, why is tundra again? very cold. Oh, Siberia. Okay, okay. Like, yeah, Siberia. So, so means that there is water in the soil, and the soil is constantly frozen. The water in the soil is constantly frozen? Is that what it is? Yeah. Ah, okay, makes sense. Wow, plants can grow there. I'm amazed. Yeah, it's most like mosses and lichens and very, very small, very small, very hardy plants. So they cannot grow trees? 
I mean, once in a while you'll get a tree, but it will have very shallow roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that's sad, but sure. Wait, wouldn't that mean they have a lot of things like landslides because they don't have plants to hold the roots and the soil? Or is it things like what? Landslides. Landslides, rock slides, when the mountain oh, breaks off. Oh, right. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I would have to look into that. Hmm, interesting. Right. It's either that or the the soil is too frozen to break. Either or. Right. Mm, could be either, yeah. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to continue. And the intense cold prevents rain from falling for most of the year, leading to a landscape dominated by shrubs and mosses. Tundras occur at high latitudes, where the sun's rays are much less intense, and in highlands and on mountaintops elsewhere, which are similarly cold due to their altitude. Wait, what, 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 what picture is this? I have not uh, seen This it. is leading into what I'm about to talk about next, which is cold deserts. This is a desert? This is a desert. Okay, not a desert that. is a desert is defined by how much rainfall it has. So if it has under a, a lower than a certain amount of rainfall, it is a desert. That's why the poles are actually deserts. They're cold deserts. But the poles don't have land. They are ice sheets. Uh, Antarctica is actually land. It's if you took away the ice, there would still be land there in Antarctica. What? Okay, okay. I'm learning new things today. Wow. Makes sense, okay. At even higher latitudes than tundras, it becomes so cold that there isn't a wet season at all. These are the poles, where the cold and dry lead to the creation of cold deserts like Antarctica, the world's largest desert. So, biomes. Lots of trees around the equator, where the Hadley cell gives us all the rain. Trees, 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 all of the trees. Now some grasses around the trees as the rains start to run out. And leaves the land barren around 30 degrees from the equator where the rains have run out entirely. Fun fact, hot deserts aren't hot because of the sun providing more heat, but actually because there's a lot less water vapor in the atmosphere to act as an insulator. For the same reason, they get very cold at night because there's no insulator to keep the heat in. Now, since our planet spins the opposite direction to Earth, we should expect temperate forests and grasslands in the west rather than the east. However, I'm not going to include a temperate forest in the south of the southern continent because we decided that the southern hemisphere will have extremely long winters and short summers, meaning it's probably too cold for most of the year for significant rainfall. So the temperate zones of the southern hemisphere would be tundras at best. We also have a few rain shadows on our planet, causing the east of the eastern continent to be entirely desert, and making most of the northern continent into a cold desert. Next, we'll pretty things up a bit by adding mountains to the volcanic islands, and adding some colour to all our biomes. I think the south of this northern continent might experience something similar to the Gulf Stream due to the currents around this big ocean, so I'll make it a different colour to the cold desert, just because I'm not quite sure what biome it would be. I guess the world building will determine that. There will also be some greenery around the floodplains of all of our rivers, so we'll add that in too. Now for the people. Okay, wait, I want to ask, is like the North Pole and the South Pole not fixed in planets, or is that just unique to Earth? Uh, North and South Pole are usually fixed, yes. There's no North and South Pole in the map, though. The reason is, uh, as I said in an earlier section where I was drawing the map, this only actually goes up to 80 degrees, and the North and South Pole are actually at 90 degrees, North and South. So I said earlier in this that I did actually cut off the top and bottom of the map at 80 degrees North and 80 degrees South. Okay, so which it, means that I haven't actually drawn in the poles. So it must be included in any planet map, world map. If it were a globe, then yeah, everything would have a north and south pole, yeah. Mm, okay, noted. That is important to know. So we'll add that in too. Now for... Population. 
Millions of years ago, our first bipedal ancestors began to diverge from arboreal primates. Okay, so these are all monkeys, except human. Given. Well, they're all they're all apes. I would say they're all great apes, but the gibbon is there, and the gibbon is a lesser ape, not a great ape. Okay, so so we kind of evolved from there. This one, I know. Well, we didn't evolve from them. We share a common ancestor with them, but... What? What's the difference? Well, the difference is we were not once chimpanzees. Uh, there was a animal some millions of years ago um, that some of the children of that animal then went on to evolve into humans, and some of the children of that animal went on to evolve into chimpanzees. So they are like, what, our cousins instead of our siblings? Or... Exactly, yeah, they're more like our cousins. Okay, we have hairy cousins, noted. We do. On any Earth-like planet, this would have happened where forests give way to grasslands, forcing human ancestors out of the trees and onto the ground. Eventually, once modern humans evolved, there would be some who favoured a nomadic lifestyle and others who claimed small areas as their familial hunting grounds. There would be members of both groups who wondered, what if we didn't have to be afraid? What if all the food was in one place? What if all the water was in one place? Soon enough, those dreamers would find the ideal home, a river valley. But not just any river valley. A river valley that deposits excess nutrients onto its floodplain every year. A floodplain filled with plants that could easily be cultivated, with seeds and cuttings that could be selectively grown for the most favorable characteristics, increasing yield year upon year. A floodplain with animals that could easily be domesticated and fed with the crops that aren't quite high enough quality for the people. With unlimited water flowing through their river and a secure food source on its banks, the people start to think beyond survival, and so evolves progress. So evolves science. So evolves recorded language. So evolves economics, employment, power, hierarchy. Suddenly the small world around the river valley isn't big enough. This is a little bit more into like kingdom building in a sense. But yes, indeed. Early civilization. So I think I know a little bit about this because I did in-depth research and I saw never again to do kingdom building. Right. So basically, <laughs> it's like um basic needs. So everybody wants to, in the initial stages of life, you have basic needs to take care of. And after basic needs, you want to improve on that. So the first thing you go for is actually tools after basic yes. needs. Yes. Yeah. So that tools can open up to like, if you play any games of evolution, you have farming, you have building, you have research and all that kind of thing. And then where the language and the taxes and everything and the military all comes later. So the first thing they want to secure is food supply. So when they have food supplies, after that, they want to secure shelter. So that's when all the things start coming in language and all that is like way, 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 way later when they actually have production like going on whereby people are assigned jobs and stuff like that. Jobs didn't originate in that way. It came from all these needs to multitask a building and kings were selected from the people with the foresight to plan all these things. Not, not like today though. T today is a little bit different. Yes, people have everything with or without kings will be fine. That's what I think. Those nomads who come and go, trading goods from far off lands. Where exactly are those lands? Another river valley, perhaps? It sure would be nice to have those goods, those fruits, silks and spices under our control. We would be doing them a favor ensuring a surplus of those luxurious goods for decades to come. So evolves conquest. The Neolithic revolution spreads by influence from the first populated river valleys. At first, people stick with what's familiar. They find more rivers and set up farms on their floodplains, but then they become emboldened by their success. 
Societies spring up around other freshwater sources like lakes, springs, and even artesian basins, which are pockets of water underground that can be accessed by digging through the rock that keeps them sealed in. On Earth, the largest artesian basin is in Australia, underlying 22% of the continent and containing nearly 65,000 cubic kilometers of groundwater. Once they've traveled as far as they can by land, civilization looks to the sea. Those air and ocean currents I mentioned a while back? They're suddenly important again. On Earth, the cycling air currents produce permanent prevailing easterly winds. That is, winds coming from the east, around the equator and at the poles, then prevailing westerlies in between. If Earth rotated the other direction, the winds would also go the other direction. The equatorial easterlies are known as the trade winds, while the westerlies at middle latitudes and easterlies at the poles are rather unimaginatively known as the westerlies and the polar easterlies, respectively. The prevailing winds are important because they determine the latitudes at which explorers are likely to arrive on a continent. The Norse were able to sail to Iceland, Greenland, and then onto parts of modern-day Canada because of the polar easterlies, where later European exploration bringing genocidal tendencies with it, used the trade winds to land in the Caribbean, later colonizing further north and south. The fact that you brought up genocide and colonization is... yeah, respect, man. So, <laughs> in a way, is it easier to say that if you go according to the wind, the people in the, the one with the flow of the wind is at a higher advantage than the ones who are living against the flow of the wind? Absolutely, yeah. The um, the people who live in on Earth, the people who live on the um, on, I guess the east side of oceans, so the west coasts, like Europe, mm -hmm. um, were f able to colonize across the ocean far more easily because they were able to just go with the winds at the poles and at the equator. Um, however, if you're in between the equator and the poles, so in the temperate regions, then reasonably you could go west with the winds. However, there were no societies that really evolved in that region or that occurred in that region other than the ancient Chinese. Mm, that's true. Hey. And the Pacific Ocean is kind of huge, yeah. and so the ancient Chinese were not really able to go across that because, you know, it's huge. Oh, it's just like a RNG game where you were born and whether you were lucky. It's kind of like a game whereby you seek and destroy enemies first. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of sucks. But sure, okay. Now it's a globalized world. We don't have to worry about that. The, the world is like completely mapped out right now, thanks to Google, which is yeah. kind, of, kind of a good thing. So people like me don't have to be blind. Mm-hmm. The first voyages of any civilization will likely follow the prevailing winds and ocean currents of their world. Then, centuries later, more advanced technology will enable efficient exploration against the currents. Ice ages also enable migration by land due to decreased sea levels, since a lot of water is locked up in glaciers. This can create interesting historical conflicts, as some groups of people may migrate over land during an ice age, reaching a continent thousands of years before civilization develops anywhere on your world. Then civilizations that emerged independently might encounter each other, both with no record of these advanced strangers. So basically, all humans kind of originate from the same spot and then some of it decided like fuck no i'm finding my own nest and then years 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 later they are like oh my god hi human fellow human that they didn't know exist yeah that's exactly what happened we um we first as a, as a species we first evolved in central africa and then people just walked out in various ways um some sailed some rafted no, but, but yeah, mostly walking to just separate. How, how the fuck do you walk out? The earth is so huge and Central Africa is like what? Not the most, not the easiest way to get out of, if I might say. How, how, do you, how did they survive in the first place? 
Well, it was over hundreds of thousands of years, so it's like each each successive generation might have only moved like 10, 20 kilometers, but over hundreds of thousands of years and um, thousands of generations. Then eventually they move. But why? Why would they move from the settlement in the first place? Like every generation they move. Were they like nomads at the point of time or did they have like a civilization going that they moved? Well, um, uh, the first actual civilization that occurred around a river valley was only, uh, it was, I think, less than 20,000 years ago, if I remember correctly. Um, and so before that, you have a whole, you have hundreds of thousands of years of humans before that mm -hmm. who hadn't figured out, hey, we can settle down next to a water source, farm our plants and animals, and just have our food all here. And so you would have had people who were fighting over resources and one group just decided, okay, too many of our people have died, we're going to just leave. Or you could have just there was a famine in the area, just there was a drought that came through and they went, okay, we got to go. Um, or maybe people were just like, huh, I want to go somewhere new today. Let's mm. go. Yeah. Okay. I... For some reason, humanity is dumber than I thought, but sure, okay. We we, we had a long <laughs> learning process to get this far. We did, we did. But you say you say humans are dumber than you thought, but like no other animal has managed this. Yeah, that's why I say it's a long learning process. It absolutely is, yeah. I mean, if you gave monkeys a typewriter, eventually they'll be able to type a book, right? That, that was the theory. The infinite monkey theory, yeah. Yeah, so we, we're probably slightly faster than the infinite monkey theory, but yeah, it took such a goddamn long time. Holy shit. It did. We're not any better though. Like, look at all the things that we have available, but people just ignore it and be like, okay, I guess we're moving today because it's not working out. Yeah. We're just like our ancestors. Holy shit. We have not changed all that much. <laughs> Oh, realization sets in. Fuck, I'm depressed. Okay, never mind. Let's continue. <laughs> okay, so I've decided humans evolved on this central continent, which means civilization likely first flourished in its river valleys. I'll put the most ancient civilization around this river in the northern desert. It would probably be pretty easy to sail across the narrow ocean between these two continents, so a more recent civilization would probably start there. Plus another older one in the river valley in the grasslands in the far north of the central continent. There are, there are two possible ways the southern continent might get populated, either by sailing on the trade winds, which are westerlies rather than easterlies on this planet, from the eastern continent, or by taking the easterlies across the huge ocean from the central continent. I, I guess I'll choose which I prefer later. I'll pop some other cultures in here and there around the river valleys, and maybe on the edges of the big lakes in the desert of the eastern continent, as well as throughout our version of the Balkans. Humans definitely would have found the temperate forest of the northern continent too, likely taking the polar westerlies from the eastern continent. Finally, I think I'll draw in the path of human migration, starting where humans evolved. They expanded on foot around the central continent, then into the west across the huge ocean, because I can't be bothered perfectly matching up the lines on both sides of the screen if they went east. Speaking of east, they also would have crossed the narrow ocean to the eastern continent, likely from two different places. Then they'd expand across the eastern and southern continents on foot, and most likely from there, some would have taken to the seas and followed the currents to settle the world's many islands. Yay! Cities! Indeed, Along we have hit cities. Oh, finally. Th th uh, to be honest, it would have been way, 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 way easier for me to understand if you started from the city and then moved backwards in time. Because it's more relatable in a sense. Mm. I can take that into consideration for later videos. You're like a... a Start from the relatable and then move out. Yeah, because like it's mind bombing, and if I if if I wasn't doing a like reaction video review, I would be like, "Fuck this shit! I don't understand anything." <laughs> 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 yeah, really, honestly, <laughs> I was about okay. to give up. Like, if you weren't here, I would have given up. 
I'm just crying. Well, that is sad. But, but I, okay. Yeah, I'm just crying. I'm like, oh, I'm too dumb to understand any of this shit. It's okay. But yeah, city I can do it because I'm a city girl. Even if you live in the countryside, you probably would know a few things about the city, I guess. Because cities are huge. Majority of Indeed. the people have at least been to the city once in their life, even if they've not traveled out of the country. That's what I believe, though. Mm. If you have internet, you might know the city. ...comes cities. But how do you plan a city? Or do you plan it at all? Yes, you do, you The earliest do. cities were built by the civilizations in Egypt and the Fertile Crescent. They were likely created by families and individuals settling down and building shelters near each other. The clusters of shelters would have grown and collided with each other without much in the way of pattern or planning. Physical barriers like rivers they were built around, the highlands in any given direction, and the habitability of the surroundings would have determined city limits. For example, settlements around the Nile couldn't extend too far into the desert, since they'd be straying too far from their source of food and water. Actually, I want to point out here, the first city or civilization that was very advanced, you say, was in Egypt, like the Egyptians? No. No? The, the Egyptians were the second. So the first was um, the Sumerians. What that? Which country is that? Um, I'm in Mesopotamia. Where was Ur? Because that was the city of Ur, it was the oldest city. I only know like the movie one, the Mayan city or Mayan calendar, something like the Tomb Raider shit. Hmm. Uh, which modern day country is Ur in? Uh, it's in Iraq. Modern day Iraq. What? Okay. Wow. But it's very funny. They originated from the Middle East. Not yeah, that was the... I mean, there were multiple places where civilization originated. So there were multiple places where they independently started civilization. So you have the first was the city of Ur in mm -hmm. Sumeria, which is modern day Iraq. Then the second was the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. Then the third after that was the um, the ancient Chinese. That was another independent one. Um, did they, they had no then, connections, right? Yeah, no, absolutely no connections. They just all independently figured out civilization. They figured out the, all the same things independently. And then in the Americas, you had both the Incans and the Aztecs. Mm. They both figured out civilization independently as well. Well, what caused like the inspiration to simultaneously, almost simultaneously come to that conclusion? Was it like God's voice or something? Well, it's because um, people figured, okay, we have the water source here. We have plants that grow in this area that we can eat, that we realize we can continue to keep growing them. Um, and we can continue to uh, breed these animals that we have in this area. And so we have consistent food, consistent water, consistent shelter. And so what it comes down to is um, the values of safety versus the value of freedom. And so pretty much all of these people who independently started civilizations, they, they prioritized safety over freedom. So they prioritize the safety of having everything centralized, having just permanent resources and being able to, and there's also safety in education because you can educate your children and you can have collective knowledge just um, spanning thousands of years that becomes just more and more and more built up until you have like what we have today with the internet and electricity and just so many incredible things. And that's, that all comes from people deciding that they were going to prioritize the value of safety over the value of freedom. So there had to be like at least one wise person back then who's like, fuck this shit, no, we're not doing this. Yeah. And, and decided to like not move his ass. And then everybody just decided, hey, you know what? You have things that are good over there. I'm going to join you. Yeah. And then that person who originally decided becomes the ruler because they're like, well, I have all of the resources. So... You are going to follow my rules. That's how city is done. Mm, mm. Makes sense. Okay, so it's like a one person's house becomes like everybody lives near to them and then eventually they upgrade this and then it becomes like a whole network of stuff that initially didn't work out, I'm assuming. 
so they learn from their mistakes they're like holy shit you you just like you know pop over next door and like steal my stuff now i'm gonna build walls something like that yeah or uh, or or potentially they might have gone oh i'm gonna tell everyone else that you stole my stuff and then everyone else goes well maybe we should have rules against that and then you get law mm, makes sense and then jobs come in yeah okay city planning it is let's go once conquest and invasion became a real possibility, the placement of cities became more important. Damascus is a particularly good example of the strategic placement of ancient cities. Even today, in satellite images, you can see a sharp line where the city is pushed up against the anti-Lebanon mountains, making it near impossible to invade from that direction with ancient technology. Argos in Greece is similarly positioned against a mountain but also has proximity to the Mediterranean Sea via the Argolic Gulf. Though most ancient Greek cities sit very close to mountains, partly due to Greece being mostly mountain. This led to the popularity of city-states, with kings ruling everything in line of sight, since the mountains provided a good first defense against invasion, and because technology wasn't initially advanced enough for the speedy communication required to enforce laws over great distances. Wait, in that case, if they build it right at the mountain, it's still quite a distance away from the sea. Did they even have the technology to, to like get there and get the resources they need, or was everything available from the mountains that they built it on? Well, they would have had a... Um, they would have built near water sources, so you sometimes have... Um, the snow caps on mountain, mountains, they melt at certain times of year to fill up lakes that are at the bottom of the mountains, or you can have rivers that just come from the top of a mountain, and they all would have had some kind of water source that they were building their um, cities next to. So the cities, did they actually develop this water network thing that we have nowadays? Or did they not have those? They manually carry irrigation and stuff. Yeah, they would have manually carried their water. They wouldn't have had um, aqueducts and things like that. Aqueducts didn't come about until um, until Rome, I think. I can't think of any aqueduct systems prior to Rome. Okay. Wow, humans humans were really determined back then. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, fuck this shit. We, we set our home here. I'm not moving the house. I'm moving the water instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, respect. At this point, we've only really talked about planned city placement, and not planned cities. So, let's change that. Fundamentally, planned cities fall into three categories. Radial cities, grid cities, and cities that tried to be radial or grid cities, but then gave up and turned into spaghetti. <laughs> radial cities are cities that radiate from a central point, which could be a building, a hill, a river, or anything else of significance to the people living there. Nuremberg was historically a radial city around the Pegnitz River, with a wall built around it. Much of the wall still survives in the modern-day city, which retains its radial form. Grid cities are just that, cities built in a grid. That includes linear cities as well. Chicago in the US is an example of a grid city. In fact, I've been unable to find another city with a grid as strict as Chicago's. The benefit of a grid city plan like this is that they're easy to expand. Where radial cities require the addition of another full circle that gets larger with each expansion to maintain their shape, grid cities can more or less add extra infrastructure in whichever direction they like. And it doesn't upset the structure. This means they're not impeded by difficult to terraform highlands or lowlands or by other population centers growing to meet them because they can just grow around. In favor of radial cities, a circle has the smallest possible perimeter of any shape of equal area, so the more circular a city, the smaller its border, meaning radial cities are inherently more defensible in land and sea warfare. They're also far better for efficient transport. In a radial city, the major roads take the form of rings and spokes, so to get to any location, you take one spoke, and one ring, always choosing the smaller of the two possible rings, of course. In a grid city, on the other hand, you're forced to travel the longest possible distance between any two locations, because they're functionally anti-Pythagorean. 
You want to take the shorter diagonal route? Nope, sorry, only right angles here. Regardless of their pros and cons, in both cases the most important element of city planning is the placement of residential and commercial areas. Residents need to be able to easily access commercial areas, but also need to not be impeded by them. A central commercial area makes sense until you have supply lines cutting through the outer residential areas. So you add major roads for the supply lines in a straight line directly from the outside to the inside. However, now as you expand, the commercial areas are further and further from the newest New residential areas, so you need to add smaller commercial areas for those residents to go shopping. Okay, so basically what they are saying is due to population control and like the supply demand, the city doesn't actually work very well if you put everything in one place. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay, how is it like? Like if you've got everything in, if you got everything in one spot and then you people keep moving in there and the city keeps expanding, it's gonna take like an hour for someone on the outer edge to get into the middle of the city, or even longer if you go prior to cars and fast transit and things like that. How is it like in Australia? Because I know Singapore is kind of working this situation out. I don't really know much about Australia at all. Uh, in Australia, we do tend to have central business districts where a lot of people to commute to for work, and it's not always that great um, because people do have long commutes, and it would be a lot easier if people could work from home more or have local offices in particular areas. But like in our cities, we usually have a central business district um, and just smaller shopping centers spread out around the place. So yeah, you can go shopping in other places, but it's very hard to have a job outside of the center of the city. Did it improve over the COVID period? Because everybody is actually forced to work from home. Did that solve the problem or no? Oh yeah, that definitely improved. Yeah. Um, but there are obviously a lot of employers who are kind of dicks. <laughs> and they say, no, now that COVID is over, I demand that you be in the office, even though... Um, it's actually been shown that during the period when people were working at home, people were actually at a higher productivity rather than lower productivity, which means it would make sense to have people work from home more rather than less. But employers, as I said, are sometimes dicks. I don't think it's an employee issue. It's a human issue. I mean, it took us, what, a few thousand mm. years to figure out that, hey, I can plant my ass down here and make things work instead of moving yeah, it took us that long. Yeah. So I think it will take us a month and I don't know, man, another 20 years or so to realize that we can do this. I mean, in certain yeah. traits of the job, like for example, teaching. Okay, maybe you can't actually teach online, especially if you're teaching things like yoga, if you're teaching things oh, like Oh yeah, of piano. course, yeah. You need the physical one-to-one, -one, okay? But like other things, like for example, if you're going to do like financial calculations, send over the document. You send over the yeah. document through email. Like you're just doing an Excel spreadsheet. You can send an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, you, you send it through an email in the office. What's the difference of sending it through an email to yeah. your home? <laughs> I don't get that. It's not like you need to walk into your boss's office and put it on his desk in the past years in the past years whether they had like folders and stacks of files that your boss needs to sign on paper yes now we're going carbon free yeah so it's a little yeah. bit ridiculous yeah i'll give it 20 years i guess hopefully humans in 20 years i i have faith in you guys i might not be around but sure <laughs> right we're almost to the end of the video thank god and one more minute <laughs> let me finish this i feel like i lost too many brain cells along the way it's okay Etc. Etc. Ad infinitum. I'm not going to plan any cities today. No! Instead, I'll leave you with this world map and all the theory you've learned throughout this video. I hope this video gives you the tools you need to make great realistic fantasy maps, or to mercilessly critique existing maps if that's your style. Just remember, fantasy worlds don't have to be perfectly realistic. It's absolutely fine to have some features shaped by magic, but a little realism can really help with immersion and might give you some world building ideas you hadn't previously considered. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you could take the time to leave a comment, like or subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. Now go map your fantasy world. Okay, okay, I will. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
This is like a very good introduction to world building in a very realistic form, but you should definitely make another part for like the city planning thing. Because you oh yeah, I will at some point. The reason why I didn't make a um, city plan is because that would have added like an extra 20 minutes to the video. Compared to 40 minutes with the Big Bang Theory that I couldn't cope with, I think yes. I think that would be better. To, <laughs> you you probably should have like you know started with something like that first, and then mm. branch it out because you realize a lot of newbie writers, I would say beginning writers, they don't start off with multiverse. They start off with like uh, countries, or like not even country, like mm. in a city that kind of thing. You know, it starts off simple, and then they branch out, and then they're like, oh my god, okay, now that I got the hang of how to make two cities work, how about an entire country? And then when they get an entire country, it's like, how about wars between two countries, three countries? How about a world war? And then they're like, oh my god, world wars are too overrated. The intergalactical wars, you know? So <laughs> I feel like they branch yeah. out from that would be a lot easier for people like me, especially I've not reached that stage. You know, I barely passed kingdom building if i barely pass the middle ages of kingdom building what makes you think i can understand helium and hydrogen and carbon yeah honestly like oh also, yeah it's certainly would potentially be an idea for me in the future to start videos in a um simple. more relatable place and then expand to larger higher concepts from there yeah, you can make it a series. If you need, I, I can I can sit in and help. <laughs> like <laughs> you using my 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 three brain cells, I can help you out with that. But <laughs> because most of your people are gonna be three brain cells like me, I have a feeling. Actually, no, most people are two brain cells. I'm three brain cells. I'm like one step ahead, man. <laughs> you are laughing. You are, you're like judging me so high right now. But yes, thank you so much for making this video. It is really helpful. So I guess some of the Yay. people who will be watching the playback would also find it helpful uh, in a sense whereby they get the breakdown of this. So yeah, you might also want to like live stream some of this, like break it down, break, break, break the, the things into easily applicable concepts in a sense. So you can do like a prompt thing. I, I guess people learn better by examples. You can give a few examples of, okay, in a trope of like, a, I don't know, Star Wars, and then you relate back how this video helps to build certain characteristics. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, Star Wars is a particularly like painful one because all of the planets in Star Wars are just like, this is desert planet. This is forest planet. This is ocean planet. <laughs> This is grass planet. This is city planet. I'm just like, can you not have just the slightest bit of diversity on any of your planets? No, you see, this is exactly why Star Wars is great for people with two brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> Understand now? <laughs> why do you think Hollywood movies are so overrated? Because what the more you get to know them, the more you're like, oh my god, I know exactly how this is going to end. I don't even have to read the reviews, you know? That's why mm. I start watching movies at a certain point and I stop reading at a certain point because every time I pick up a book, I'm like, okay, I, I guess this is how it's going to end. I don't even have to read the story. Everything is predictable. It's been done before. There's hardly any Sometimes I will do that. I'll like pick up a book and then I'll read it and I'm like, just like, I think this is exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to end. And then I'll check the ending and I'll be like, I was correct. I know. And then I'll put it down because I'm just like, yeah. I know. I used to buy thousands of dollars worth of books from like the book fest. I bought so much that they shipped it to my house. I don't do that anymore because my bookshelf is broken for years. Uh, I had too many books. So I like after a while, it gets to a certain point whereby after two brain cells, you develop the third brain cell. And that's when you're like, okay, shit's getting repetitive. I'm not going to do this. And then you throw in something that's like 10,000 IQ. And I'm just like, oh, I can't cope with this. So yeah, w working backwards would be better, I guess. Right? I'm looking forward to your new video though. Wanna see what you have up the sleeve. Right, so for guys yep. who is on chat, I uh, don't know who is on chat. Okay, there is actually another one that I know of. Uh, it's not Wonder Draft. It's, um, what's that called? Incarnate. Have you heard of Incarnate? I have heard of Incarnate. There is a small issue with it though. In their terms and conditions, they say that um, they can use anything you create with their software for any purposes they like. I mean, yeah, sure. Well, well, like, well, what will you use it for? Like, do you have an issue with that being used? Well, I do have an issue if they tried to claim copyright over it. 
Ah, uh, okay. So unless you try to, I don't know, include it inside like your publishing book, your contents page or something like an appendix, I don't think it's too much of an issue, right? Yeah, it's not too much of an issue. It's just, it's something that I'm wary of. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. Because copyright laws are very touchy nowadays. But okay, so yeah. for the viewers, okay, I'm saying this for my viewers. If you want to, if you don't want to spend $30 on Wonder, uh, Wonder, Wonder, Wonder Draft, Okay, if you don't want to spend thirty dollars on Wonder Draft, you can check out Incarnate. If you don't mind the copyright thingy, or uh, you just want to use it for some reference thing because you can't draw for shit like me, I think Incarnate is fine, right? And then if you need any help, okay, I'm pretty sure Kilen is more than happy to help you guys out with it. So just leave like a comment Absolutely. on his YouTube. Leave a comment on his YouTube. The video for this, the the link for this video is actually in the description, so you guys can check it out. I guess that's all for today's stream. Thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Finally to the end. How long did it take? <laughs> Holy shit! One hour forty minutes, but the video is only forty minutes. What have I been doing? <laughs> Crap! <laughs> this comes to show how much school I missed. Okay, All right. So I'm gonna end the stream now. Thanks guys for joining. I'll see you guys when I see you guys. Don't forget to check out my second channel as well because I might play Minecraft with this dude. Alright, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.